how do you build a high-performing culture? This is Culture Architects. Candid conversations with extraordinary leaders sharing their biggest successes, failures, and lessons learned on their culture journeys. Here's David J. Friedman. So today's guest on Culture Architects comes to us from the other side of the pond. Peter Docker is a leadership consultant. He's an executive coach. He's uh, an author and uh, an author of a great book called Leading from the Jump Seat, which is what we're going to be talking about today. He draws from decades long background in the military and aviation. And he's got over 25 years that he spent in the Royal Air Force and more than 14 years partnering with businesses all around the world. He's got a lot of really interesting ideas and maybe a different take than some of what we often hear about culture. So I'm really excited to uh, share ideas with Peter and, and, and give Peter a chance to uh, share with our audience. So Peter, thank you for joining us this evening on your on your uh, schedule. <laughs> David, it's an absolute delight to be on your podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So I, I want to, for the sake of our audience, Peter, I want to start with just framing a little bit of definition of what mm -hmm. is leading from the jump seat. What does that actually mean? And then I want to go back maybe a little bit historically and come to, so how did you come up with all of this and then what led to all of that? Sure. So let's just start to, as a baseline, help our audience understand what do you mean when you say leading from the jump seat? That's, that's kind of an unusual language. Describe that for me. Well, I'll share a story with you, David, okay. which was the uh, the catalyst, if you like, for that that okay. title. So, as you mentioned in your kind introduction, I, I spent quite a few years in the the military. I was a pilot. Um, mm -hmm. I became a senior officer in the military in the UK. And uh, at one point in my career, this goes back, oh, good heavens, uh, over twenty years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, I'd been training other pilots, and I just certified uh, this young guy called Callum brand new captain on the aircraft that we flew, which was a large passenger jet carrying about 140 people. And he'd been doing his training to become a captain after having spent many years as a co-pilot. He'd been taking about six months to do the additional training you need to become a captain in charge of the entire aeroplane. And the final check was for me to act as his co-pilot as we flew, flew from London over to Washington and then on to San Francisco. And the approach into San Fran is very busy, as I'm sure many of your listeners will know. And anyway, Callum did a fantastic job. And we landed, we taxied in, we shut down. And I turned to him and said, Callum, you did a brilliant job. That's your final check. You are now fully certified as a captain. We're staying the night here in San Fran. In the morning, you'll have a regular co-pilot with you. I'll be down the back of the aircraft with the other passengers catching up on paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, well done. It was a great moment, as you can imagine, because it was a big step for, for him. Anyway, the following morning, we came back and uh, I was just reading a magazine while Callum was doing his pre-flight preparation he needed to do as a pilot. And he came up to me, he said, excuse me, sir. He called me sir because we were in the military and I was his senior, senior, senior officer, you know. He said, excuse me, sir. He said, um, it's exceptionally busy during rush hour out of here in San Francisco. Um, can you come and sit on the jump seat to act as another pair of eyes to look out as we're taxing to make sure that we go the right way and just, you know, give me some backup, just looking out for other aeroplanes. Well, insurance. Yeah. And I, I turned to him and said, of course, Captain, I'd be delighted to. And I thought in that moment, that was a hugely courageous thing to do because he just got me off his back. You know, yeah. I'd been examining him, checking him for the past six months. And this was his first opportunity just to go it alone. But he had the success of the mission, the safety of the aircraft in the forefront of his mind. And he wanted me to sit on the jump seat, which is a third seat on the flight deck of large aircraft. You've got the captain's seat on the left and then the, uh, the co-pilot seat. And then you've got the jump seat immediately mm -hmm. behind. And it's so close you can touch the pilot, you know, but usually it's empty. And uh, anyway, that's where he wanted me to sit because you have a great view outside of the cockpit. So I strapped in and we uh, got clearance to start up. We taxied out amongst all the other aircraft. And Callum did a brilliant job, as I knew it would, and we lined up ready for takeoff. And we got the clearance and Callum pushed forward the throttles and we thundered down that runway. Everything was going absolutely fine 
until we'd lifted off and we were at about 300 feet, very close to the ground, when suddenly we had an emergency. And it went from all peace and quiet to where Callum was wrestling with the controls, mm -hmm. trying to keep us from hitting the ground. And I knew that in that moment, what I chose to do would fundamentally affect the safety and the outcome and whether I and everybody else, the 140 people on board, would survive or not. What I chose to do was absolutely nothing. I sat there with my hands in my lap, perfectly relaxed. And I knew in that moment, I didn't need to lead. I needed to be a great follower. Mm -hmm. I needed Callum, this brand new captain, to feel that I had his back, to sense that I had confidence in him to be able to sort out the situation. And mm -hmm. when you think of it, David, if I didn't have that confidence, I would have no him. business. <laughs> so I think exactly yeah. that, you know? So I just needed to let him get on with it. And so this drove the notion of leading from the jump seat because Callum had invited me into that jump seat and that invitation was everything. And what it made me realize is that, you know, at some stage we all hand over control, mm -hmm. quite literally in an aeroplane, you know, whether we're the CEO of a company or um, the leader of a team or even a parent, you know, our kids will grow up and leave home or start to lead their own lives or we move on to another team or as a CEO, will retire. So handing over control is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And jump seat leadership is all about embracing that inevitability. And when we do, we become intentional about lifting others up, training them and equipping them. So when the time is right, mm. they can take the lead and carry forward those things that are deeply important to us. So that is the story of jump seat leadership and it builds then on several practices that enable us to to indeed lift people up and give them that space so they can take the lead so let me paraphrase and see if i'm explaining this in a way that that's accurate so when we think about how most of us lead mm. ab absent leading from the jump seat that the way most of us lead is we think hey you know, I'm going to build, I'm going to build a great organization and I'm, I'm the head guy or the head woman, and I'm going to make sure that we're going in the right direction and we're doing the right things. And yes, we certainly want to delegate some responsibilities because I can't have everything on my plate. So at some point mm. I got to delegate to other people, otherwise I'd be overwhelmed. And so hopefully I've trained them well enough that they can do what they need to do. I would call that traditional leadership. Mm. And what I hear you saying maybe as a paradigm shift there, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that what you're saying really is, I should be as a leader, I should be thinking about not only, I should be thinking about preparing my team, not simply to make it easier on me, but that my responsibility as a leader is ultimately I'm going to pass control to them and everything I should be doing, or at least a large part of what I should be doing is preparing them to be ready to take that on. And so that my focus as Absolutely. a leader becomes, how do I prepare my team to be able to take on more and more responsibility and lead themselves? Is that a an accurate way of describing it is that. and you know that involves several facets as i know you recognize david you know it, it's yes you've got to train them so giving you the example of callum as a pilot he mm -hmm. spent years training uh, he'd started off himself as a co-pilot um he then acquired the skills so as he could um aspire to become a captain and receive that training um so that had taken quite a long process of training and very intentional mm -hmm. training um, not just in flying the aeroplane, but also all the other aspects of, of leadership of a, a, a crew. But then um, we have to be able to take that, that step back. And remember, I mentioned mm -hmm. uh, the last part of his training was where I was sitting alongside of him as his co-pilot, walking, if you like, alongside him to mm -hmm. ensure that he had everything he needed to feel confident in leading as a captain. But there's another facet to this story, I think, which is really worth dwelling on. 
which is the invitation. His invitation to you. His invitation to me. You know, he invited me to become part of his team mm -hmm. in the sure knowledge that he would trust me not to interfere or undermine his uh, role as a captain or anything like that, which would detract from him doing his job. And if we put that into, say, the, the business world, you know, mm -hmm. just imagine anyone who is uh, out there head of marketing or head of sales, imagine training the person who's going to succeed you and you do that very successfully. And then they come to you and say, look, I know I'm now head of sales, but look, I've got this really important meeting we've got. Would you mind coming and sitting in on that meeting with this client just at the back, just because I think you might have some expertise that we could draw on at mm -hmm. certain times during the meeting. That is a higher level of mm -hmm. relationship, of trust, mm -hmm. and of an extraordinary culture. So uh, leading from the jump seat is very much an end result. You know, it's about um, being clear on the, the commitment that you have together as a team, uh, where you're heading, being aligned on that, um, but also lifting that person up, equipping right. them so they can take the lead and get to the point where they may just invite you back onto their team. <laughs> so so let's, let's kind of dive deeper on that. As I'm hearing you, it to be able to, to have that kind of a setup, that kind of a relationship, let's call it mm. that, requires both the the leader, the original leader, having yeah. a willingness to let go and to teach and coach for the purpose of letting go and empowering mm. the other person, and also requires the other person, the, the new leader, let's call him that, to be egoless enough to welcome in and invite, to use your word, to invite uh, the original leader in. So yeah. let's take those one at a time. And I'm curious about your, your experience with, so that would seem like a good thing to do. And yet I would assume it often doesn't happen that way. So <laughs> what are the things, let, let's start with the, the original leader who we want to, mm -hmm. um, we want that original leader to be able to learn to let go. Yeah. What keeps people from doing that? Why don't most people do that? What gets in the way? Everything that we do in life that's important to us, everything is driven by one of two things. It's either driven by fear mm -hmm. or by love. Now, fear, I'll come back to love in a moment, okay. particularly in a business context, but let's look at fear for a moment. Um, fear is a, a natural reaction when our life is threatened. Fear can step in to save us. You know, it has us step back from the oncoming car that we didn't see until the last minute. And that's fine. That's good. But fear can also uh, be triggered when we sense that our livelihood, our status, or our reputation mm -hmm. is under threat. And when we sense those things, then uh, <laughs> what fear generates is not often helpful. <laughs> it has us closed down. It has us think of ourselves rather than others. Mm. It has us see the world as a place of scarcity. And unless it's, well, unless it's checked, then fear can lead us to make decisions that ultimately um, hurt people. You know? um, but then we have love. And when we're driven by love, then it's for something. It's for something that is deeply important to us. It's for what we believe. And when we're driven by love, then we see the world as a place of possibility, mm -hmm. not scarcity. We, we open ourselves up to think about others rather than thinking about ourselves. And importantly, unlike fear, where ego raises its head, mm -hmm. we lead with what I call humble confidence. And humble confidence is about being absolutely resolute on where you're heading. Um, that's the confident bit, but also um, being humble enough to listen to others. So that's what helps ego um, or is inoculates against ego. Mm -hmm. um, when ego is triggered by fear, then the thing that bridges fear and love is courage. 
courage cannot exist without fear, but it can only be sustained through love. So whatever we're engaged in, um, and you know, I've led people in combat, and I can tell you there's a lot of fear around, but also there's a lot of love for the people alongside you, although we might not express it using that word. And when we source ourselves from a place of love, things that are deeply important to us, things that we stand for, then it gives us that courage to continue. It helps us to suppress that ego, to keep thinking about others and see possibility where others may only see scarcity. Mm-hmm. So that's why one of the practices of Jump Seed Leadership is around humble confidence. So how do you take a leader? And I would say my experience is that I would say that the vast majority of leaders that I've seen mm-hmm. struggle with ego, um, mm-hmm. probably act using your language more from um, fear than from love. And mm-hmm. yet, if you're working with them, you need to help them to shift that paradigm um, and be more based on what they're for, um, what it is, and to have the courage to go for what they're for and to, and to have that abundance mentality instead of a scarcity mentality. How do you help somebody to do that? Or is it just innate? You're, you're born that way. Um, how do you help somebody to change that if that's possible? Uh, it is, <clears throat> and it's accessible to all. So uh, I, I use uh, quite a few distinctions in language because when mm-hmm. we distinguish meanings behind words, we can have different conversations Absolutely. and get different results. And so uh, one that I, I use is particularly helpful in answering your question is the difference between a stand mm-hmm. and a position. Okay. Um, a position is against something. A stand is for something. And I, I love using the example of, uh, well, I live out here in the, the English countryside and the roads leading into our village, they're very narrow. Mm-hmm. And so when two cars go in the opposite direction meet, uh, one, they, well, they both have to stop. And uh, one usually has to reverse as the other, other can pass. But what often happens is the two cars come nose to nose, bumper mm-hmm. to bumper, fender to fender, and they both take up a position against the other. And mm-hmm. that might look like my journey is more important than you, yours. You are traveling too fast. You need a backup. And the thing with a position is that it gets more and more entrenched. The other thing about position is that it can't exist without a counter position. You know, that situation I described with the two cars wouldn't exist if there weren't two cars. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, and a position, you, you go nowhere. Uh, in the case of the cars, quite literally, you go nowhere. But then there is a stand. And what if those two drivers, when they come together, one of them has a stand for being courteous on the road? Mm-hmm. That person immediately reverses up to a passing place to allow the other car to go past. What happens is that the, the position the other driver may have started to develop, that immediately dissolves mm-hmm. because there's no catch position. But the person who's reversed up to the passing place, their stand for being courteous is strengthened. So stands are very important, and we all have stands. You know, I refer to them as um, the starting point is identifying what are our non-negotiables, mm-hmm. those things that go even deeper than values, because values can change, actually, and they, they do, but non-negotiables go deep. And when we're looking for what our non-negotiables are, we can look at the different experiences we've had in our lives. And I write about a few of mine in the book. And when we take those feelings, those moments in our lives where we've chosen to turn left instead of going straight on, for example, Mm -hmm. even when others were saying, do you really want to do that, David? You know, is that the best idea? Why don't you stick to having... But we know we've got to make that choice and turn left. When we put those feelings into words, they can become stands. And this is really, really important because when we're facing a situation where perhaps we don't know what to do and we can sense that fear rising up inside of us, then the courage can come from our stands. Mm -hmm. The stands are always sourced from a place of love, love for something. And that can give us the courage to continue to be sourced from love and to find the humble confidence to lead and to keep that ego suppressed. Mm-hmm. So in answer to your question, 
we all have access to this. It's about taking a look at our lives um, when we've had those points of inflection in our lives, putting it into words and identifying the stands that we have. And we can have, you know, two, three, four, five. We'll probably collect a number mm -hmm. of stands as we go through life and have different experiences. And together, that is our reservoir of courage to draw on, particularly when we don't know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. And that is a place we all find ourselves in when we choose to lead. So let's take a quick pause from our conversation with Peter Docker, former RAF pilot, leadership consultant, and executive coach. When we come back in our next episode, Peter and I are going to make more connections between the language of jump seat leadership and our own language of culture building here at the Culture Architects Show. This has been Culture Architects with David J. Friedman. Join us next time for more insights and wisdom from great leaders in all walks of life. To book David for your next event, or to learn more about his writing, speaking, or consulting, go to davidjfreeman.com. Culture Architects with David J. Friedman is a production of CultureWise.